success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. On the show with us today, I am so glad to have you here. This is going to be a lot of fun, just in case you didn't know. We're going to have a blast. Sharon Kendra, who is the president and CEO of High Road, Inc., which is a touring company. Let me try that. A touring truck company or a tour trucking company. <laughs> Boy, you could say that just all about any works. way. Yeah, all yeah, of the above. All works. Based out of uh, Franklin, Tennessee, a suburb here of Nashville. Originally from upstate New York, she spent most of her life in the Boston area before relocating to Tennessee in 2016 and launched High Road. She has worked with artists across all genres, including Switchfoot, Meshuggah. Uh, yeah. I haven't heard that one before. Dropkick Murphy's Surfaces, Toby Mac, Old Crow Medicine Show, Red Bull. The Wiggles. Yes. And many, many others. Mom to two adult kids, who I think you call the Bigs. The Bigs. Okay. That's them. Uh huh. And two teenagers, the Littles. <laughs> I get it now. She spends her free time with her family, enjoying travel and, of course, live music. Sharon, welcome to the show. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. I Glad told to be you here. This would be fun. We haven't even really started haven't yet. haven't even started. Let's yeah. go. You getting into the trucking industry, mm -hmm. it, that's typically, well, maybe I should say this. You getting into the touring trucking industry is typically not the norm for most people mm -hmm. and especially a woman. Well, yes. <laughs> how, how, True. Did, how did that come about? The, the touring or the trucking part or both? Let's, let's look at both of them. Yeah, so the trucking side um, it was just really, I've been in sales my whole life, um, and I just answered an ad sales job years ago. Kind of an interesting story. Um, went through the interview process and um, didn't say too much, just listened a lot, was hired, started the week later, and I actually thought I was working for an airline. I didn't know I was working oh, for a really? trucking. Oh, yes. really? Turned out I was working for a trucking company. Um, so from there, we just focused a lot on um, conferences and live events. I was in that world for a while, uh, trade shows primarily. Right. Um, one night, I had a, my, one of the bigs at the time. She was a little. Was really into the Jonas Brothers. Um, ah, of mm -hmm. course. Yeah. Yeah. So we saw them every time they came to town. We're at a show one night, walking through the hallway, and I looked over and I saw what I now know are road cases, which look a lot like trade show cases. Saw a bunch of labels on them, and some of the labels had our trade show competitors' names on them. I went, wow, yeah, this might be a lot like doing trade show shipping. And um, just started down that path, digging into it, trying to figure out how and why and where, and here we are. I remember when I first got full-time in the business, mm -hmm. late 70s, early 80s, and I had the opportunity to take on a tour that was called Markham and Broadway, and it was two grand pianists, grand <laughs> okay. piano players, and it was sponsored by Yamaha. Mm-hmm. And the deal was we had to transport these nine-foot concert grand pianos in road cases across the country and set them up in what back then were really considered community concert events. Mm -hmm. So you could be at a high school auditorium or a gymnasium or you could be at the small theater in some sure. you know, little town. And that really gave me my very first flavor of what trucking was like. Now, I had worked a couple rock and roll tours where I had to take turns driving, you know, the, the box van or the right, bobtail right. truck full a little of van different. gear. But transporting two nine-foot concert grand pianos across the country 
setting them up, tearing them down, you know, waiting for the piano tuner to show up so right. he can tell you that you set the piano up incorrectly. <laughs> we got that a few times. Um, <laughs> sure. But it's, it's a tough job, and it real, you spend a lot of time on the road. The guys that, the people that you hire mm -hmm. to do this really have to be a very special breed, don't they? Gosh, they really do. They really do. And just to clarify, I don't drive trucks. <laughs> yeah, you're <laughs> so, right. You're, you're the one who tells everybody where to go. Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah, I don't drive the trucks. Um, and, and truly, we've been blessed. We've had some really amazing drivers over the years. But it is a special breed. It's um, They're gone for months on end. It's a long day. It's a long night. Um, a lot of alone time. And your experiences with touring in the past, um, buses are different, right? So buses, there's more of a community, even the driver of the bus, he's interacting with more of the people that are riding the coach. Um, truck drivers are riding solo. They're alone the entire time. So it really takes a special person to be able to do that and do it well. I think one of the things you told me in a, in a conversation we had some weeks back was that Nobody really knows who the truck driver is on the tour. The truck shows up, mm -hmm. it gets unloaded, he goes to sleep, mm -hmm. and then it's time to load the trucks up and he's back out on the road. Right. And a lot of the people on the tour, of course, as you just said, there's no socialization going on mm -hmm. with them. That's got to be even tougher because you're part of this big rock and roll circus, for right. lack of better terms. <laughs> and nobody even begins to understand your role in it, which is really the most vital role, which is to get that cartage from point A to point B. Right, right. It is a challenge. Um, I think for, especially for the drivers, if they're a little bit more extroverted, then they have a better chance of connecting. They're going to meet more people. Um, they have to be willing to have those conversations and stepping out of their comfort zone a little bit, especially when they're in catering. Um, and just getting to know some of the people. But honestly, a great tour manager, a great production manager, they're going to make sure they're connected. They're going to make sure they're taken care of and that they're getting into that community feeling. So really, a lot of it does rely more on the, the management of the tour. You started your company when? Um, well, I started High Road in 2016, right about the time that I moved to Nashville. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. And then the pandemic hit. And then the pandemic hit. And that really took a toll on everybody in the industry. It did. Now we've recovered somewhat mm -hmm. from 2016 to today. Mm -hmm. How have things changed in that world for you? Obviously, fuel prices are much higher. Right. What other logistical nightmares are you looking <laughs> at when you put someone out on the road? Oh, logistical nightmares. That. That's a good question. Well, interestingly, when we first um, started, a lot of the touring we were doing was in box trucks. Um, we just found this real niche market. We had a lot of artists that didn't need a full semi, but had too much to tow in the trailer behind their bus. Right. Um, and it really was it, was, it was not actually intentional, but it was just a direction we wound up going in to fulfill a need. Um, so we were pretty busy with box trucks um, for the first couple of years. Um, we started, then the pandemic hit. We, we pretty much just, you know, we, like everybody else, I think, we just went bare bones, got rid of everything. Um, coming out of the pandemic, so many things had changed in terms of availability, supply chain, pricing. It wasn't just fuel. Um, the price of a box truck about doubled from before the pandemic. So when we started getting those calls for uh, box trucks again, there was just no way we were going to spend that kind of money on a box truck at that point. And the waiting list was probably about a year old for uh, a new one. Um, so we went back into semis, stuck with the semis. So that was something that changed. Um, some of our previous clients we couldn't work with any longer if that was what they were looking for. Um, getting equipment was really, really difficult. Getting drivers? Not really. Really. You know, one of the things I heard was that when the pandemic hit, all those tour managers, production managers, mm -hmm. st 
stage managers, carpenters, riggers, electricians. They all went out and had to find real jobs. That's right. You know, and then all of a sudden touring kind of comes back into play and they're like, yeah, I mean, I get a steady paycheck and I have a 401k now and, you know, Benefits, why, why, yeah, why would I leave that to go back out and do this? Yeah. It turns out I like my wife. I kind of want to stay yeah. home with her. <laughs> Sleep in the same bed every night. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. But with the truck drivers, it wasn't necessarily the case. Mm -mm. No, not necessarily with us. We did maintain. So we have another division up in Boston that my oldest son runs um, that does. One of the bigs. One of the bigs. Yeah. One of the bigs uh, that we still continue to focus on freight up there. So we do general freight, general freight shipping. Um, so we did a lot of that during the pandemic. We started doing some retail because retail just went through the roof. Um, when you say retail, what, what do you mean by that? Retail. retail um, we were doing some new store installs. We were doing a lot of shipping for new store setups because people were, it was one of the things you could do during the pandemic was right. go shopping. Um, go to Target. There was a lot of people, a lot of people at Target. Yeah. So we did a lot of that during the pandemic. But but most of the drivers, they did stay driving with us or elsewhere. You know, one of our best drivers, he was delivering chickens. <laughs> Not for us. <laughs> um, and I think that was different from what some of the other experiences have been because there was still a need for truck drivers. And there were still trucks on the road, probably more so, honestly, during the pandemic because of the supply chain and people needing more and more and more, um, just being home and the consumption. Yeah. I read an article, in fact, just a couple days ago that I pulled up here uh, from The Who's Roger Daltrey, the lead singer uh -huh. of The Who. And he was commenting about he's not sure if The Who will ever tour the U.S. again. And he goes into detail and he said it's not, not only the insurance matters because the insurance mm -hmm. costs are going to but in this is where I quote him, most of the big bands doing arena shows, by the time they do their first show and rehearsals and get the staging and crew together, mm -hmm. all the buses and the trucks and the hotels, you're upwards of 600000 to a $1 million in the hole. Mm -hmm. To earn that back, if you're doing a 12-show run, you don't even start to earn it back until the seventh or eighth show. That's just how the business works. The trouble now is if you get COVID after the first show, you've lost that money. That's right. Is that still an ongoing concern in your world? Okay, great. You get the phone call. We're going to go out and do a tour. I know it's going to be X number of dates, 20, 30, 90 dates or whatever right. it is. And then that happens. The lead singer gets COVID or the guitarist or everything has to shut down. How do you deal with that? Yeah, you know, we, we've we been really, really lucky. Our last 2022, I think we only had one tour where COVID became an issue. Um, and, the, the you know, what the artists did was they just took that two-week time period. Right. Rerouted the dates, threw them on the end of the tour, and just took a little bit of downtime. There's really not a lot that you can do if it's a two-week period. Depends on where they are in the country. By the time they bring everything back, bring all the production back, unload it, it's time to reload it again and send it back out again. So it's really not even worth it. So you basically, if something like this happens, you just pause. We just pause. And take a deep breath. Yeah, I might send the driver home. He'll take the truck. He'll take the production with him. Right. Um. Or he'll stay put, yeah. you know, he might just wind up spending a couple of weeks out on the West Coast, <laughs> which is really economically makes so much more sense than the fuel he'd have to burn to come all the way back to Nashville. Absolutely, because yeah. you're not spending that whatever it is, five, six some odd dollars a gallon for diesel. Exactly right. Because we're not talking about putting regular gas in your car. Right. These are diesel trucks like the buses. Yes. And it's more. And it's heavier. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and they consume more. They consume a lot and more. And then you also have the issue where in some states you have to pay taxes or permits or fees to travel through. Oh, there's lots of fun things <laughs> that we experience. There's permits. Like, you know, a lot of this, interestingly enough, you know, you don't know till you don't know. Um, when I first started out, I didn't know any of that. 
I was in trucking. I thought I knew what I was doing. I really didn't. <laughs> Baptism by fire? Exactly yeah. that. Exactly that. Trying to figure out how to get a permit to drive through a state at 3 o'clock in the morning. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I learned quick. I had a, a tour back, in fact, 1990. This is how far back I go, even farther than that. But we had a tour bus uh -huh. that left Nashville to go meet us up in Calgary, Alberta. Then we were going to oh, drive across Canada. the country. So he's deadheading <laughs> yeah. up to Calgary. And he gets to the Canadian border and they go, who are you and what are you doing? We didn't know there was certain paperwork we had to fill out. Oh, my gosh. To get an empty tour bus across the border sure. to meet us. And we almost didn't have a tour bus. Because Canada steps in and they go, we have our own buses, mm -hmm. you know. Why aren't you using one of our buses? That's right. Well, because it's our bus. This is the bus we use all the time. It's our home. You run into those problems? Yes, actually. Um, we had one issue. We, we started running into Canada a few years ago. Um, we had one issue with, as we got, tour was getting closer to the Canadian date, found out our driver had some legal issues. <laughs> <laughs> Quo and they, air quotes yeah. air quotes they yeah. stop you it just you know you can't have a dui within the past 10 years um you can't owe back child support you can't oh, have a tax with you know with tax liens right. things like that so we had to fly another driver up take over and i said it's your responsibility to get from point a to point b you can meet the truck back up again when you get there yeah if you don't show up you don't have a job and i'm not and I'm not paying for you to get over there. Um, and he moseyed his way over and made it. But we, so we had another tour, really interesting. Uh, newer tour manager on the tour, they got to the Canadian border and they didn't know what the rules were as far as getting people over the border. They had three or four people on their bus that couldn't cross. Oh. They canceled their Canadian dates. <laughs> <laughs> But that's all part of the logistics right. in the touring world, and, right. and, and trucking and busing is no exception. No exception. No, yeah. no. And, you know, and some of them, you realize that we, we have a division that really focuses on the tour that is going from um, the trailer behind the, behind the bus and moving up into a semi, and we call it touring up. Oh, um, yeah, I like that. That's nice. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah, our tagline is "Let's tore it up." Um, so we focus on that, and with that, we do some handholding um, with those with those tour managers, production managers that don't know what the rules are, what the rules of engagement are, what they need to know before they cross a border, or how to load that semi. Those are the things we hold hands with. Yeah. We're going to take a break, get a word in for one of our sponsors, and when we come back, we're going to have some more. To me, this is very interesting <laughs> and exciting Glad you uh, think so. conversation. Hey, I, I live that world. Anybody on the road lives this world. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have some more conversation with Sharon Kendrew. When you have a cord synth at your fingertips, the possibilities are endless. Be it digital, analog, analog modeling, altered FM, wave sequencing, or the multi-engine synth. Core gives you easy access to a variety of features to help you get the perfect sounds quickly. Whether you're a professional musician or just starting out, Korg truly has a synthesizer to help you express yourself. Visit Korg.com or your favorite Korg dealer to get your hands on one of their products to create new music always. Korg, the official sponsor of the business side of music. Back in the studio here, Nashville, Tennessee, with Sharon Kendrew, who is the CEO and president of High Road Inc., which is a touring trucking company. I don't know why that hangs You'll me up. You'll get it. Yeah. You'll get it. She is the president and CEO of High Road Inc., a tour trucking company based in Franklin, Tennessee, the pretty part of Nashville. <laughs> it is indeed. <laughs> I want to jump back into the conversation a little bit. You were talking about you know, we're, we're talking about international touring, getting mm -hmm. from the States to Canada. And, I, and I'm going to assume Mexico's the same way. I've only done one tour of my life in Mexico, and we flew. And to all of, my, to all of our Mexican listeners down south of the border, 
it was a very interesting time. You'll just have to read about it in the book someday. <laughs> but you mentioned a production manager or a tour manager mm -hmm. not knowing all of the rules and the particulars. Does that become an education process for you to provide all of a sudden for them? It does. It does. When they're going, obviously they know their job. They know what they're doing. Um, so I'm not saying in any way that they, they don't understand what the role that they were hired for. But there are some things that are a little bit different when you're loading a trailer versus loading a semi. Um, some things you need to be aware of. And so we do, before we have a tour, we do a pre-tour Zoom call. We bring in the lead driver or the only driver. It's usually, if they're touring up, it's usually one semi. Um, so we bring that individual in um, on the Zoom call, and we go through our list of questions with them, answer any questions that they have, um, try to help them understand. You know, sometimes they'll ask about space and dimensions of the interior of the truck, load bars, straps, ramps, what kind of ramps we have available, what they might need for the tour. Um, Things like that, really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anything like permits or border crossing, we take care of that. Last tour that we have actually going right now um, didn't have a broker on the Canadian side. So. And that's important, isn't it? It's a little important. Yeah. <laughs> Only if you want to get your stuff over. Right. Other than that, it's not a big deal. <laughs> yeah. And that's changed a lot from, like, say, the first time I went across into Canada, which was 87, 86, somewhere around there, mm -hmm. to today. It's, it's definitely not easier. It's, in fact, it's probably more difficult to get across the border now. Of course, back then, if you had a driver's license mm -hmm. and you had a, a temporary work permit, you know, a green card, whatever, you could cross the border. Now it's a passport and you better have, I, I'm assuming, a work visa of some kind and the permits to go with everything. Well, we don't, we don't require work visas to go across, okay. um, but we do need to do, they need an e-manifest, which is an ACI and an ACE, need one going in, one coming out. To make sure that what goes in comes out? Exactly. Yeah. And we don't deal with the brokerage side. There's some great people that do that. Yeah. Um, so they take care of all the carnets and the international paperwork I don't need to know. Um, but we do take care of the manifest, getting it in, getting it out. You have to have certain... PARS numbers, PAPS numbers, there's things like that that you need to know about. Um, so we'll walk with a tour manager or right. a production manager through that and just explain the information we need from them um, to make that happen. Then the other thing that kind of popped into my head while we were having this conversation is the loading and the unloading of the trucks. Sure. The, the packing or unpacking. Mm -hmm. That's a bit of Tetris, isn't it? <laughs> it's a great bit of Tetris. Yeah. Yeah. Who does that? Is it is it the production manager and the local stage crew? Is it the truck driver supervising? Because ultimately, the truck and the cartage that's inside of it, it's really your responsibility, I would think. It is. It is. Yeah. So it is the crew's responsibility and the production manager's responsibility to load it. It is the driver's responsibility to make sure it's loaded properly. Oh. Yeah. A so lot of people don't know that, that the truck driver really needs to be standing there when it's so it's secured well not just secured but the truck has um axles and he has to make sure the right amount of weight is balanced on the right axle if they get pulled over at a weigh station and they're out of even if the truck can hold forty thousand pounds if it's not balanced over the axles they will stop that truck and make him unload and reload it till it's balanced properly and that's something you don't necessarily want to do on your own or at all. <laughs> yeah, or at all. Really? Yeah. Usually there's not enough downtime in between venues that you really have a lot of time to stop on the side of the road and repack a truck. So it is his responsibility to make sure everything is secure, that it's in there tightly, that the load bars, the straps are secure, and that the load is properly balanced with their weight. And that brings up another topic of conversation, and that is the driver, his or her sleep pattern mm. is totally different than anybody else's. It's very different. Yeah. yeah. They're literally night owls. They have to be. They have to be. When they're, lo yeah, when they're loaded and then they leave that dock, they're driving straight through to wherever they have to go next. And the hours of service now is 10 hours of driving in a 14-hour period. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then they have to have 10 hours off. So when we're routing a tour, when we're looking at routing, we're very careful and cautious to make sure I know what the daily mileage run that a driver is going to do, um, how many hours it's going to take him to do that, and whether or not he's going to get safely to the next venue. We will fly in a second driver if we have to, um, if the mileage is a little bit longer. But yeah, they are, they are, they're pretty much r- well rested by the time the truck is loaded and they're ready to go. You shared a story with me a, a while back in another conversation that you Uh and I had, um, when we talk about truck drivers really becoming family. Yeah. And and, and I, I I know where you're going with this one. (laughs) And I believe you said his name, John. John. Yeah. John. Yeah. And this was a, a very unusual situation, but what a lot of people don't understand, especially in the touring industry, the, the rock and roll music touring business. Yeah. We don't shut down for anything. The, the show must go on. That, that adage yes. is ever present. Yeah. But in a situation with John, it, there was a heartbeat that for a moment had to stop. Well, everybody kind of gathered their thoughts and said, okay, oh, yeah, what are we going to do? Do you mind sharing that? I'll try. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, it's emotional. Um, it's it's a really emotional story. Um, John has been with us, gosh, since the beginning. He's 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 more than a driver to us, really. He's, he's family. He's family. Yeah. And he's part of the team, and he's part of the company. And um, there's not much he couldn't say to me, and there's not much I couldn't say to him. Right. We've walked together through a lot of different things. Um, John's oldest son was murdered last year. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> I still have trouble saying it. Oh yeah. gosh. Mm. And that is something that those of those of us in the industry that's difficult to wrap your head around. It's I think it's difficult for anybody to wrap their head around that when right. you lose a family member. But when you're on the road touring and you're hundreds if not thousands of miles away from home. Yeah, and you get that call. Yeah. And you get that call. Um yeah, so it, you know, he was on tour with Collective Soul and Switchfoot. Um, and both tour managers and me, you know, John, John reached out to me first. Um, my next phone call was the tour managers from both camps and, oh, they were just amazing. Amazing. They were like, get them home. Yeah. But this, once again, this gets down to this is family. This is family. And I told you I'd have a hard time talking about this. (laughs) But, but I think it shows well, first of all, it shows the love that you have for your people. Yeah. But I think it also shows that these tour managers, these production managers were like, let's do what we have to do. Right. They weren't worried about the show. No. At that moment. Absolutely they, not. They were worried Mm-mm. about their focus, their concern was getting John home where he needed to be with his family. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So we did. And, and at the same time, quick. everybody's juggling balls and spinning plates. and Right. This is just not something that you're expecting to deal with in the midst of a tour. And, right. you know, and, you know, those things do happen, but um, it's how you handle it. And but there was kind of a cool thing that happened yeah, there was. when he came back out on the road and yeah. you told me the story. And that's where it got me when you told me that not only did they embrace him with open arms when he came back. But now all of a sudden, he's literally <laughs> in the spotlight. He is. So John, actually, John's been in the music industry for years. Um, all kinds of roles. Had a band at one point. Yeah. Guitar tech. Um, it's funny we talk about it. He's a musician who happens to drive a truck. Yeah. Well, listen, there's a lot of musicians <laughs> out there who probably drive trucks. Right. Yeah. Wait tables, you know, yeah, whatever. Exactly. Um. So we sent John home for a couple of weeks. He went back out on the road, um, and it was right around his birthday. John Foreman of Switchfoot called John, our John, yeah. out on stage. Um, and I don't even know how the sequence of events happened at that point. But they invited him out on stage, and they wound up having him play guitar for a song. How cool is that? Yeah, it was he. Ladies and gentlemen, our truck driver. Our truck driver. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, they had him play guitar out on stage. Within about a week, about a week, 
John was on the set list. (laughs) (laughs) Every night, John had one song that he would go out and he'd play guitar and he would sing with the band. And it just, it, you know, it made all the difference in the world to him. Yeah. And us. Yeah. We're going to take another break, get another word in for another one of our sponsors. And when we come back, we're going to have some more conversation with Sharon Kendrick. Hi, everyone. I'm Larry Butler, and I want to send you a free digital copy of my new book, The Singer-Songwriter Rulebook, 101 Ways to Help You Improve Your Chances of Success. That's right. Everything you need to know to launch your career as a singer-songwriter, all based on my 40 years in the live performance arena. And believe me, I've seen it all. In my book, you'll find the 10 things you have to deal with before even thinking about becoming a singer-songwriter-performer. You'll also learn about the five things every singer-songwriter can do this weekend to make their live show better. Five things I can guarantee that you are not doing already. Plus, there's tips on songwriting and staging, photo and video shoots, publishing, merch, dozens of other topics. All written for people who don't particularly like to read. And again, it's free. Just go to the Business Side of Music website homepage and look for my book cover. Click on it, and a free digital copy of my book will be yours. I'm Larry Butler, and I approve of this message. Thanks. Back in the studio here on the Business Side of Music, Sharon Kendrew, who is the president and CEO of High Road, Inc., a tour trucking company based out of Franklin, Tennessee. We touched on it briefly earlier in this conversation where things were when you began in, began in 2016, mm-hmm. getting through COVID, and now here we are a few years later. Pandemic seems to finally be dissolving, going away, mm-hmm. we, we hope. What do you see is the future for the rock and roll touring business? And, and I had mentioned uh, a little bit earlier that it seems to be tougher to find the people. Mm-hmm. It seems to be tougher with the logistics. Do you see that easing up? Do you see that changing? How How is this all going to evolve in the next year or two or three? Um, it's an interesting question. We, we've been watching it a lot. I think that um, people are a little concerned about the economy, so the tours are definitely a little leaner. Um, We're not seeing nearly, well, 2022 was just insane. It was insane. In in what aspect? Um, Everybody was out on the road. Okay. Um, And because everybody went out on the road, the routing was nuts because they couldn't get the venues to fall in sequence of what made sense for them. Sure. And so you were zigzagging all over the country. Or as we used to call it, dartboard touring. That's exact. That was, that's a great term for 2022. The booking agent would just throw dartboards and hope that it hit a city that somewhat made sense. Happen to have a venue available. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. So 2022 was just crazy. Um, we would get tours on a Friday for a Monday tour. Needed a truck. Well, you would get a phone call on a Friday? Yes. For a tour that was going on on Monday. Mm-hmm. Holy yeah. cow. Because they, they, didn't, they didn't have availability. The tours were booked. They had somebody. They backed out at the last minute. It was crazy. It was crazy. Has that calmed down? Oh, yeah. Very yeah. much so. Yeah. So this year, very different story. Last year, we would get a call on a Friday. We'll sign a contract now. We don't care what it costs. Okay. <laughs> awesome. This year... Um, Rates have really dropped. Um, it's become more competitive. Um, and that, some of that is following the freight industry. Freight has settled down quite a bit. The rates have dropped. A lot of trucking companies have, gotten, have left the trucking business. A lot of companies are closing their doors. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it, more of the guys who have one or two trucks um, are starting to close their doors because the freight rates are so low, they're barely even covering the cost mm. of fuel. So we're feeling some of that on the concert and the rock and roll side for sure. Um, and then with the economy, people tightening their belts a little bit, watching, seeing what's happening in the um, just, you know, in our economy in this country in general. Um, it's not. And I'm, I'm grateful it's not as crazy as last year. I wouldn't want to repeat that every year. Um, but I could, see it, I could see people being very cautious over the next two to three years. The cost of tickets, and I speak 
from personal experience because mm. my wife and I purchased a couple of tickets to go see a, an upcoming show. And I was, the sticker shock was just mind blowing. Yes. But I, there's the other side of me when I put on that tour manager or that production manager hat. When I realize there's still a cost of doing business out there for these people that are on the road touring, for folks such as yourself. Do you see that settling down at any point? Or do you think this is just kind of an ongoing, I don't know, tug of war? The cost of tickets? The cost of the, the, the whole touring the experience. The whole touring cost yeah. for now. Yeah, I mean, I really don't see things, you know, it depends on what you're really looking at. When you're looking at the tours, how many trucks are they taking? How many buses are they taking? How imp- Is that scaling back at all or is that um, staying the same? I haven't really seen it scale back yet. Really? Okay. The wow. The only places I've really seen it scale back is if somebody's looking at that, going from a trailer up to a semi, didn't really anticipate the cost of that. And they'll say, okay, we're going to scrap a couple of things and do away with it. Um, We've seen almost some of the opposite. We've seen tours where they'll book three trucks to go out, and they're on the road two weeks and realize they need more lighting or something. And we did that. Oh, that was a nightmare, trying to find a fourth truck for that tour um, two weeks into the tour. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not really seeing people cut back necessarily. Um, I'm, I don't know. I'm not sure where they would. That's interesting that you bring that up because I remember a, a tour that I was production manager on back in 1987, and that exact same thing happened. Yeah. We were playing really, we had gone from playing clubs, mm-hmm. which didn't need a production manager, barely needed a tour manager, to all of a sudden we're doing theaters, small theaters, sure. you know, 1,000, 1,500, maybe 2,000 seats to literally almost within two weeks, arenas, Mm. festivals. And it was like, we don't have enough sound. Mm -hmm. We don't have enough lights. Okay. Now, how do we get that and have a catch up to the tour and then maintain that? You're right. Now, all of a sudden, you're scratching your head because you're going, I need another semi. Right. And not just I need another semi, but gosh, where's your production coming out of? I remember getting that call. And uh, it was a Thursday. And I'm going to need another semi. How soon could you get one? I said, well, where's it going? Nashville or Vegas? I'm not sure. I said, well, that's... <laughs> <laughs> there's only about 2,000 mile difference yeah, there. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's a big difference between Nashville and Las Vegas. And um, so by Monday, we figured out it was, it was Nashville. Um, and we still didn't have a truck. So for the first two weeks, we were using, you know, tour trucking is really different from freight trucking. Those guys are, you know, they're, the, the trucks are equipped differently. Um, they, they know what they have to do. Freight guys, when they're driving trucks, they drop and they roll. They get in, they get out, they're done. They're not going to sit and wait. They're paid by the mile. Um, for the first two weeks, we had to hire freight trucks because there was just no availability anywhere in the country. So we had a guy come in, pick up at a venue, drop it at the next one, and he'd leave. Oh, my gosh. Then we would get another driver to come in, pick up at the next venue. So there was no acclimation. It was just oh, you're no. just trying to make all the dots connect until yeah. you could. Mm-hmm. Oh, my gosh. Right. Right up until we found, you know, we were hustling it. We finally found our driver with a truck, got her there. That one was a female. She was amazing. Um, got her out there, and she stayed on the tour, and that one ran another Oh, my gosh, I don't know, another four months after that, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that was a long one. Holy cow. Mm -hmm. People want to find more about your trucking company? Yeah. How can they do that? Where do they go? Well, we have a website, highroadusa.com. We are on Instagram. We are on LinkedIn. Um, You'd have to ask Instagram. I think we're High Road USA. Um, I am on Instagram, Sharon High Road. You can follow me there. Um, we're on all the social media, Facebook. Does anybody still use that? I don't know. <laughs> I think we're still on I Facebook. I do. I'm old school. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate your time.